Good morning. Wow, hear that echo. Good morning. It sure is great to see all of you. And uh, it's, uh, welcome. I keep talking. What do you think, Stan? They're saying. Mm. Back up just slightly. Working outside is fun. There we go. Okay, that's great. Well, good morning. Welcome. It's glad I'm glad to see all of you as we gather together to worship our Lord. Uh, the Lord's provided us with a great day. It's not too hot, not too cold, just about right. It sounds like a Goldilocks kind of day. So uh, we can thank the Lord for what he's given to us today as we gather together to worship him. I'm uh, thankful for the McPhee family. Uh, we tried to change their names, but uh, no, no, we couldn't do that. So welcome McPhee, also known as McPherson family. If you want to know that story, you can talk to Stan later. Uh, the McPhees are here to lead us in worship today. Before they, uh, they do that, uh, just a couple things to keep in mind. Uh, Uh, should I keep? Oh, there we go. If uh, you need to use the restroom, you can just uh, enter right through the gym. All right, and uh, it's all you just follow the follow the arrows there. There, and uh, I'm thankful for this tent. Thanks, Troy. Uh, if it does start to rain, we're gonna all kind of scoot in under, uh, and uh, you can head for your cars. But uh, it looks good. Looks good. So uh, I'm thankful for uh, people that have shared with me. So thanks, Troy. And uh, so. As we uh, worship our Lord, uh, let's bow together and let's pray. We thank you, our Father, and we give you glory and praise. Uh, we praise you, Lord, that uh, we can gather together right here uh, in this, uh, this parking lot and that we can worship and honor you. We thank you for this nation where uh, we have freedoms to gather and uh, to worship. We praise your name. Lord, as we honor you, we pray that you'll be glorified and praised. Use us, Father, as uh, the people of God right here in this community to worship and honor you and to share that good news of Jesus Christ. Because we know that Jesus is the one that saves. That Jesus came to the cross and died for us to take our penalty for our sin and then rose again the third day. We thank you. We praise you. And we ask, Father, that we'll proclaim that message with all of our heart. For we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. It's, it's great to be here with all of you. I just want to read from Psalm 96. Am I on? It says, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among the people. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. We're just going to open with a, it might be a bit of a new song to us, but it, I've always I really enjoyed worship, and it's one of the ways, our song, and that's one of the ways that I personally have um, enjoyed worshiping the Lord is through song. And this song is about um, having a song in your soul and letting your life be a symphony to the Lord. So if you know it, we'd love to have you sing out with us. Ready, girls?
Uh, welcome again, and uh, I want to say uh, thanks to Diane. She provided the uh, the floral arrangement, uh, and she borrowed. She said from her neighbor. So thanks, uh, <laughs> Diane's neighbor, uh, for that as well. And uh, did you uh, go to VBS this week? It was great. And if you didn't have a chance to get there this week, the, the nice thing about virtual is that you can go uh, later if you want to go this week and check that out or if you want to see it again, it's still there on the, the Gary Baptist Church YouTube site. Uh, so uh, uh, you can uh, go and enjoy that. So uh, if you go to Gary Baptist Church on YouTube, and uh, you can pick that up. And uh, many thanks to all the people that uh, put that together. I did a fantastic job. And uh, wasn't it great? And one last uh, time, I'm going to mention about uh, Green Hill Lake Camp. Uh, if you want to be involved with that uh, by uh, a bursary from our uh, uh, from here at the church, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Just make contact with the office, and uh, we can uh, uh, help you with that. I'm going to invite the McPhees to uh, lead us again here as uh, we worship the Lord.
those of you at home can't see the people behind the scenes, but I, uh, I'm thankful for, uh, for Corey and for Stan for all that you're doing. Thanks. Appreciate your work. Thanks, McPhees. That uh, was super. Thank you very much. We're, uh, we're thankful to the Lord for you. Can you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12? We've been uh, working our way through uh, Hebrews 12, and uh, we're going to come to the end today. So uh, turn there to Hebrews 12, the last two verses. Before we uh, read uh, from Hebrews 12, let's pray. We're thankful, our Father, for your many blessings on us, and we thank you, Lord, for the great blessing it is to have your word. Uh, we praise your name. We thank you, Lord, that you chose to speak. Help us to listen. Uh, Lord, this uh, is your good and, and perfect and, and complete word, and we, we praise you for that. Lord, you've been teaching us over the last number of weeks uh, that we need to trust you. Help us, Lord, to do that. Uh, give us the, the faith and the courage to put our trust in you and in you only. And Father, we pray that you open your word and that we might uh, hear, that we, by hearing, Lord, will do what you tell us to do. Thank you, Father, for this lovely day and that you uh, brought us here today. Uh, be with us and uh, near us and uh, stirring in us. We pray, Father, for our province and for our nation. We ask, Lord, for our leaders, that you'll give them clarity of, of thought and that you'll give them wisdom, that you'll bless them, Lord, and help them as they uh, make decisions, uh, it seems like, every day that uh, affect us uh, in different ways. Uh, give them wisdom, we pray. Guide us, Lord, as your people. Help us to know your strength and your power. We pray for our nation, Father, that we will be uh, strong, that you'll bring healing into uh, lives. And, uh, Father, we pray for your glory to uh, be shone all over this world, all over this land, all over this nation we know as Canada and this province we know as uh, New Brunswick. We pray, Father, for uh, those who have, uh, have needs right now. We, uh, we think of uh, Phil and Kay. Uh, bless them, we ask. We pray for uh, Sybil and for Luther. Uh, be watching over them, Father. Uh, we think of others that have uh, been a long time in, uh, in care facilities. And uh, we think of Dorita and, and Merle. And uh, bless them, Father. And uh, we ask your, uh, your strong hand to be upon them. Pray for those who mourn, asking Lord for your strength for them. I think of Connie's family, bless them. And uh, we think of, uh, of others like uh, Myrtle and, and Marion. Uh, Lord, strengthen them and keep them, we ask. Father, minister to us by your Holy Spirit. We know, Father, that you are dwelling in our midst, that you have chosen to be with us. We thank you, Father, for that. We marvel at that. We ask now, Lord, that you will uh, show us your way and help us to walk in it. Give us the courage and the strength that is needed for this day. And may we, Lord, look to you each and every day, for we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12 uh, at verse 28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Well, I have been talking to you over uh, the last number of weeks and, and hopefully encouraging you over those weeks uh, to put your trust in the Lord. Uh, this chapter 12 especially uh, speaks a, a great message to us about that, that we should uh, trust in Him and that faith is what uh, pleases our God and that the, the faith uh, that He wants us to uh, put is faith in Jesus Christ. Remember this great chapter begins with that, uh, that encouragement to us, fix your eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. And uh, the truth that we need to trust Him is throughout the Bible especially here in this late part of the, the book of Hebrews. And I uh, share with you uh, about these people, about the, the folks that received this originally, that they uh, uh, had a, a hard uh, situation, that they lived in, in hard times. It was hard for them to be believers in Christ, and that they, they faced all kinds of troubles for their uh, stance for Jesus Christ. Some were put in prison. Uh, some, when they went to visit uh, their friends in prison, would have their property confiscated. Uh, we read about that in uh, Hebrews chapter 10. 
There was also the struggles that they had uh, concerning uh, where they had been and where they were going and uh, trying to uh, rectify the, the Old Testament with this uh, New Testament that was being uh, written as they were uh, becoming cr uh, followers of Jesus Christ. And the writer reminds uh, throughout the book for us to fix our eyes on Jesus, to look to Jesus, the one who is the, one who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. And the author helps us uh, with this faith, with this matter of faith. And, and it's in a sense what he's doing here is uh, uh, it seems like before I go, it's almost like he's, he's getting ready to close this letter. And it's, uh, it's an, by the way, before I go, that's the sense of what we have here in these two verses. Uh, so the question remains, who is this? Who is this that we're told that we need to trust in? Who is he? He's described here uh, in these last uh, words as the consuming fire. Well, what are we talking about? What uh, is being made reference to? Is he, He's not talking about a campfire. Now, I love campfires. In fact, uh, you may see over on your right there uh, uh, preparation being made for a, a, a new campfire pit. I love campfires, but that's not what's being talked about here. It's also not really a forest fire either as uh, scary and unpredictable as a forest fire can be. Uh, it's not that that's uh, being referred to here or even a fire in the wood stove on a cold day. And as pleasant as that is, uh, no, it's not that that's being referred to. The consuming fire is speaking of the great glory of God. God must be praised. And God is the one who must be praised. And there is no other who can be praised and who should be praised. We are told that God, our God, is a consuming fire and that we need to worship him. You see, these, these folks, they knew him. They knew him from the pages of their Bible. The Hebrew people, they, they knew him. They knew the fire. They knew Genesis 15, 17. They knew the story of their, their ancestor Abram who, while he was sleeping, the fire walked through the blood. We're told there that it was the, the flaming torch and the, the, smoking, the smoking fire that, that walked through the blood and uh, showing us that, that fact that God himself would take our place, that God would, would take our punishment for our sin, that even though we're the one who breaks the covenant, God is the one who has said long ago, I will keep it for them. The fire. Well, there's Exodus 3. They would have known uh, Exodus 3 well. Their, their ancestor Moses, who encountered the Lord in the burning bush. And the Lord spoke to him there and commissioned him to go uh, from there. And uh, they would have known the fire from Exodus. Uh, we read about in Exodus 13 at verse 21. The Lord was leading the people of Israel and the, with, with this cloud of fire at night, this, this pillar of fire. And I think one that's, that's excellent for us in our time is, is Exodus 14. And if you have your Bible there, Exodus 14, uh, we read more about that, that fire that was guiding them, that, that presence of the Lord with them. And in Exodus 14, in verse 19, we read, then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. Uh, important for us to know that the, the context here, of course, is they are getting ready to uh, cross from Egypt, heading towards the land that the Lord had promised them. And as they are making their way, the Lord is leading them. Yet now he's going to go around behind them and shield them. We read on there in verse 19, the pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other side, so neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground. 
ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of, of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He made the wheels of their chariots come off so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Did you catch that little detail in verse 24? During the last watch of the night, the Lord had been with them the whole time. He had never abandoned them. Yet it was near the end of the night that he did his work, that he did what he does to uh, defend his people. And I think of, you know, how fitting that is for us right now even, that uh, as long as we might have to wait, we know that the Lord in his perfect time does what he will do. He is the one who is the consuming fire, and the consuming fire, of course, is all about his glory this glorious God of the universe. He chose to reveal himself. He revealed himself to his chosen people as the, the fire. And this is uh, who says to us and who comes to us and says, you can trust me. When we put our trust in God, we're trusting in the all-powerful, the all-knowing, the ever-present, the one who was and is and is to come. When he says, you trust me, we know that we are putting our trust in the only one that is trustworthy. He says to us, you put your trust in me. Well, there are three things that uh, the writer helps us to do that are included in his concluding remark to, to help us in this, this walk of faith. How is it that we can live out faith in Jesus Christ? Well, the first one is that he says we are receiving the kingdom that cannot be shaken. This is a not of this earth type of kingdom. This is the, the kingdom that cannot be shake, shaken, the kingdom of the glorious God. And as we read throughout the Gospels, Jesus is always talking about the kingdom of God. He's always inviting people to come be part of the kingdom of God. He is the answer to the burning question that's all throughout the first part of the Bible. That's all throughout the Old Testament. That burning question, who is this son? Who is the king? Who is this son of Adam and this son of David who would come and establish the king that the kingdom that would go that would reign forever? And of course the answer is Jesus. It's a kingdom. And a kingdom really requires three things. Of course to have a kingdom you have to have a king. Our king is Jesus Christ. And to have a kingdom, you have to have a realm. His realm is the entire universe. It's all his. Every little bit that you can see and every little person that you can see, and all of it is his. It is his realm. And, of course, a kingdom requires a third important factor. It's people, subjects. A kingdom requires a king. A kingdom requires a realm. A kingdom requires a people. His loyal subjects are those who will gladly call him Lord. And the Bible makes it clear to us that there is a day coming when all will bow their knee to Jesus Christ and declare him as Lord. How glad we can be right now that we can gladly declare him our Lord, that we bow to him and we call him our King. We who trust in Jesus are being ruled by the greatest king that there is, by the best king that there is, the God of glory. He is the great king. Well, the next thing the writer wants us to, uh, to, to take to heart is that we, uh, we must be kept be, being thankful. Let us be thankful. Sometimes that's difficult, to say the least. In fact, that can be kind of a... Yikes. Really? Because it's so hard for us uh, sometimes to be thankful. Uh, thankful for this? And we can fill in whatever the blank is, that hard thing. Yes, he wants us to be thankful for this, thankful in all things. And I think of the people that received these, uh, this word the first time. 
they were in a tough spot. They lived in hard times. Yet they can be thankful. So often, instead of being thankful, we get scared or angry or critical or despondent or you name it, we can fill in the blank with the Lord says, be thankful. You know, I'll admit to you, it's over the past few months, it's felt like many days I've been holding this all together with a bit of bailing wire and a whole lot of duct tape. Uh, some days it's tough to be thankful. But it's the right thing to do. The Lord has made it plain. He wants us to be thankful. He wants me to be thankful. He wants you to be thankful. And I remember hearing one time that one of the greatest disappointments in life is someone who's, uh, who doesn't believe in God and something great happens in their life that they just can't explain and they don't know who to thank because they don't believe in God. See, we know who to thank. We know who to go to and say, thank you, Lord, for all the ways that you're looking after us. Thank you for the salvation that you've given to us in Jesus Christ. We are to be thankful people to the great God of glory so that the great God of glory, that consuming fire, so that he gets the credit, the glory that he deserves. We have a, a worship song that uh, blends these ideas together. It's uh, to God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life in atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let his people rejoice. So come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. We can be people of great thanksgiving for what God has done. Because we can recount in our minds the great things that he has done. And what are the great things he has done? There are many. But those things that, that are so numerous, amongst them, what I think is the most amazing is that he saves. The greatest thing that he has done is he has saved a sinner like me and he has saved a sinner like you. And we can be thankful for the great things that he has done. Well, the third thing that he wants us to do to help us as we walk on this walk of faith, as we put our trust in the Lord, is that we must worship God acceptably, as it says here, with reverence and with awe. You see, God deserves worship. And as the scripture describes throughout, he is perfectly jealous. And je his perfect jealousy is so often connected up to worship of him. His desire uh, for us is like that of a, a husband and wife in a covenant of marriage. There is no room for any others. When the marriage ceremony happens, the statement is made as part of the vows, forsaking all others. That points us to the great and true uh, covenant that the Lord has struck with us that there is to be a forsaking of all others. There is no room for any else. We must worship him alone, the one who is our consuming, the consuming fire, the one who is our God. And he is not a ruler like a ruler of this earth that derives their power from God. Uh, the rulers of this earth would not have any power unless God gave it to them. No, God is not that sort of, sort of ruler, and he could never become a megalomaniac ever. Instead, he deserves worship. There have been rulers throughout history that have decided that they would have the worship of the people. You're going to be hearing about a good example of that over the next coming uh, few Sundays. Daniel is a, is, a, is a wonderful example of that, of a ruler that became so fixated on himself that he uh, demanded worship. Only God can demand and only God deserves our worship. God is the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords and he deserves our worship and it's uh, glad we can be glad and we can come and we can worship him. And this is who comes to us and says, you trust me. He's not a tyrant. He's not a weakling either. He's the sovereign God. He is the consuming fire. 
And I think of Deuteronomy chapter 4. I think it really uh, ties this together quite nicely. Deuteronomy chapter 4, uh, it speaks of the one who is the consuming fire. And we read there about, about him at verse 15. Deuteronomy 4.15 says, You saw no form of any kind the day you, the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the fire. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully so that you do not become corrupt and make for yourselves an idol, an image of any shape, whether formed like a man or a woman or like an animal of the earth or any bird that flies in the air or like any creature that moves along the ground or any fish in the waters below. And when you look up at the sky and see the sun, the moon and the stars, all the heavenly array do not be enticed in bowing down to them and worshiping things the Lord your God has apportioned to all the nations under heaven but as for you the Lord took you and brought you out of the iron smelting furnace out of Egypt to be the people of his inheritance as you now are the Lord was angry with me because of you, and he solemnly swore that I would not cross the Jordan and enter the good land the Lord your God is giving you as your inheritance. I will die in this land. I will not cross the Jordan, but you are, that you are to cross over and take possession of that good land. Be careful not to forget the covenants of the Lord your God that he made with you. Do not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything the Lord your God has forbidden. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. We must, we must worship him. And this consuming fire, this, this one who is perfectly jealous says, come, you put your trust in me. So as we put our trust in him, we know that we are trusting in the all-powerful, who knows everything, who is everywhere, who long ago chose to be with us. Now, sometimes people ask me, how long does it take to prepare a sermon? And I give the uh, very unsatisfying answer of, it depends. But it is the best answer that I have for you if you ask me the question. It depends how long it takes. It depends. The sermon took years in a manner of speaking because there's a part of this sermon that I've been thinking about and wondering about and pondering over for years. I've been pondering that, that consuming fire off and on and off and on for many, many years. In fact, I started thinking about it back when, well, the numbers were 19 and not 20. So that gives you an idea of how, how long. Because there's something that's said in Exodus chapter 40, right at the end of Exodus, that it, it's working, it's been working, and it keeps working. When the tabernacle was finished, we read there in Exodus 40 that, that the, the work had been completed. It was time for it to be opened to the people. When the tabernacle was finished, and as they're getting ready to begin the worship of the Lord right there at the tabernacle, we're told, the, in verse 34, the cloud covered the tent of meeting. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The fire, the cloud, the one who had seen them all the way through was now right there in, in inhabiting the tabernacle, filling it as it's described there. And, and God makes himself known. This is where the, the word Shekinah comes from. That old word, which means to dwell, to be present with. And the indicator of his presence was this coming and filling. And he chose to be with his people. The God of glory fills the place. And the glory, the march of the presence of God, continues throughout the Old Testament. The Ark of the Covenant between the cherubim and on the mercy seat, it's described as the glory place. When the temple is open, we read that the glory fills the place. And even when his people sinned and they were sent into exile, he was still there with them. We read about it in, in Daniel, how uh, the faithful men would not bow down to the pagan god. 
Yet there was the, the fourth man with them in the fire, the Son of Man. God was present with them. And even in Ezekiel chapter 1, as Ezekiel's ministering to them in their exile, uh, he writes there in verse 26 about the figure that, uh, of that of a man. And then in verse 28, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. The glory had not left them. God had not abandoned them. They were unfaithful, like we at times are unfaithful. Yet God was faithful to them. God remained faithful. And really it is a trail that leads straight to Jesus Christ. Because as John introduces Jesus in John chapter 1, lo and behold right there, there's a statement about the glory of God. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. It is this one who has come and dwelt among us and has given us the salvation that is ours through Jesus Christ. He came and he set up his tent with us and he dwelt amongst us so that he could do what only he could do to save us. The great glory of God, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth, Jesus Christ. You see the consuming fire? The consuming fire, of course, judges those who do not trust him. The consuming fire also cleanses and makes right those who do trust him. He has made us right. He has made us whole. He has saved us. He can and he will and he will continue, I'm sure, that he will continue to save those who are lost. The consuming fire. But you know, it seems that so often we make it complicated. He says, you trust me. That is simple. That is straightforward. It can be said in just a moment. God says, you put your trust in me. But so often we make it more complicated than that. We add pieces and parts and things that, that have to be kept and we, rem we get back to the, the sure truth of the, the scripture is that no, he wants us to trust him. He wants us to put our trust in Him. And we make things complicated, I think, because sometimes we are complicated as creatures. But I like how Chuck Swindoll put it one time. He told the story about the man who was traveling through Los Angeles International Airport. He was a, a businessman who was seeking to make the right connecting flight at the right time. And you, uh, you have traveled, uh, realized, you know, how that can be. You can be scurrying along from one gate to the next, hoping that you make it on time to get your next flight so you can get to where your, your destination is. Well, as he was making his way along, scurrying along in the crowded ter terminal, he started to worry about missing his plane. He didn't have a watch, and he was looking all around the, the terminal building, couldn't find a clock in sight. So he did what, uh, you know, we used to do. He saw someone with a watch and said, excuse me, could you tell me what the time is? Well, the man had on a, a handsome wristwatch and he stopped and he was, he was more than happy to tell him what the time was. In fact, the stranger smiled back at him and said, sure. And he set down his two heavy suitcases and he turned to his watch and he announced it's exactly 5.09. The temperature is 73 degrees, and it's supposed to rain tonight. In London, it's clear, and it's 36 degrees uh, Celsius, and the barometer there is falling sharply. In Singapore, today, it is sunny. Your watch tells you all of that, that the travel interrupted him? Oh, yes, and much more. You see, I invented this watch, and I can assure you that there are no other timepieces like it anywhere in the world. The weary traveler said, how much do you want for it? I'll give you 2000 right here, right now. Oh, no, no, my watch is not for sale. And then he reached down and he went to pick up his two suitcases and the traveler said, how about 4000 Uh No, I, I really can't. The watch is a gift for my son. I made it for him for his 21st birthday. I put lots of effort into it. I could never sell it to you. 
the weary traveler turned to him and said, how about 10,000? I got the cash here in my wallet. I'll give it to you right here on the spot. Well, being no fool, the stranger paused and then he responded, well, okay, uh, yeah, I'll take 10,000 for it. Well, the traveler was elated with his purchase. He paid the stranger with glee. He took the watch and he strapped it on and he was about to take off and the stranger said, wait. And with a big smile, he handed him his two heavy suitcases and he said, don't forget the batteries. You see, sometimes we make things more complicated than they need to be. Please, let's not make this complicated. Let's keep this very simple because the Lord has told us throughout the pages of his holy word that the Lord of the universe, the consuming fire, the one who came and dwelled among us and we beheld his glory full of grace and truth, God wants you to trust him. And we can and we should and we will. Let's put our trust in Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? Lord, forgive us when we have complicated that good news of Jesus Christ when we didn't need to. And Lord, help us to be people who keep trusting in you. We know that you came long ago for us, that you reached out to us, and that, Father, you've made it sure in your word that when we seek you, we will find you because you are the one who is searching for us, that you are the searching God. And we praise you and we thank you, Father, and we give you glory. We thank you, Lord, that when we put our trust in you, we put our trust in the one who is almighty. So, Father, keep us from being blind to that great truth. Instead, Lord, may we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. For we thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I'm going to invite the McPhees. They're going to come and lead us in a worship song as we close our service.
again for leading us to the throne of God. And uh, if you're uh, checking in with us from home via live stream, uh, we had a little technical difficulty, but we're going to upload the entire service uh, here in a little bit. Uh, so uh, glad you could join us from home, even if you only caught part of it. And uh, so why don't you stand up? Why don't you stand up where you are? Uh, and let's, uh, let's bow before the great king. Let's bow and uh, give him thanks. We do give you thanks, Lord. You are the God of glory. We thank you that long ago you sent your son to take our place. You sent him to die the, the perfect lamb of God without blemish, without sin. And as the scripture reminds us, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might be right with you, that we might be the righteousness of God, and that we might have that, Father. And we thank you that Jesus Christ paid the price for us. So Lord, go with us now and give us joy in our hearts and thanksgiving in our lives, and may we be giving you thanks in all things. We thank you for this great day that you gave to us and this opportunity to meet together as your people. We thank you, we praise you, and we give you glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you as you go.